Good morning, everybody. Democrat candidate for U.S. Senate Stephen Olicara is our very special guest today, Thursday, May 26th, 2022. For Dryden.com, I'm Ben Dryden, and you're watching a special Meet the Candidate episode of Dryden Wire Live. It's been a busy month. We've had a lot of guests on this month, including 7th Congressional District Representative Congressman Tom Tiffany, Republican candidate for Wisconsin Governor Rebecca Clayfish, Democrat candidate for U.S. Senate Cooley, Republican candidate for Wisconsin Governor Kevin Nicholson, and Democrat candidate for the 25th Senate District Kelly Westland, just to name a few. You can watch a recording of those in all of our uh, live shows on our website at drydenware.com, our Facebook page right here, just under the videos tab, or just go to our YouTube channel, which is just YouTube slash Drydenwire. But today, we're chatting with Democrat candidate for U.S. Senate, Stephen Olakara. Stephen, good morning, sir. Good morning, Ben. Thank you for having me. Yes, so I apologize. I had a little technical issue as usual this morning, so I apologize for the late start, but I'm so glad that you were able to come on. We've had this scheduled for like three or four weeks and as usual, I try not to really get to learn a whole lot about uh, a guest before they come on because I kind of want to learn the same time everybody else does. Um, I'm sure there's a ton of things that we could talk about. But first, for the people who don't know you, tell us a little bit about you. Well, sure. I am probably the least conventional candidate uh, you'll see running for the U.S. Senate uh, with an important mission, which is uh, bridging the divides of our state and bringing people together to solve problems. And that style of politics comes from my background. Growing up in Brookfield, Wisconsin, I uh, went to uh, public schools throughout my time in, in uh, Brookfield, and my parents are immigrants from India. And so when they were coming to this country, they uh, said, my son will be a future U.S. Senator. What? Uh, no, they did not say that. Oh, not gonna... at all. <laughs> <laughs> Man, come on, you're killing me. <laughs> No, they said you'll become an engineer. In fact, they said you can grow up to be anything you want to be, whether that's an electrical engineer or a mechanical engineer or a chemical engineer. All the forms of engineering are available to you. Uh, <laughs> you can and, do whatever, but, you, whatever field of engineer you want to be. See? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, politics was not on the radar of anyone in my family. And really, my first passion in life was music. I grew up uh, playing in rock bands. I picked up the guitar when I was in third grade. Uh, the drums when I was in fourth grade, and I started singing in bands uh, when I was in sixth grade. What? So if you can imagine a fifth grader playing high school Battle of the Bands, performing Nirvana Smells Like Teen Spirit, you get a picture of what my uh, childhood was like. That's awesome. Are there video clips <laughs> out there still, and do your opponents use it against you? <laughs> uh, I wish that those clips were out there. Yeah. We do have more recent clips of me playing the guitar on the campaign trail. I've been playing a lot of Johnny Cash, a lot of Tom Petty, oh, uh, and nice. I recently... I recently did a folk version of Nirvana Smells Like Teen Spirit in Green Bay. A folk uh, this is a, version? A folk version, absolutely. And absolutely. where can I find this? Because no kidding, as soon as we're finished, I'm going to go find that because I have to hear that. Absolutely. Well, we do have one version on YouTube. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, you can. And then we've got one on our TikTok and some of our social media as well. Um, and then actually on my Instagram, there's a little bit of me playing an uh, Oasis song as well. So, oh, so you're bringing uh, all the good hitters, right? Yeah. I mean, those are all the bands the I grew up listening to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love music because it brings people together. It's a great way to connect with people. And mm -hmm. for me, I, I always loved how music would often bring out the best in people. And I love the creativity. That was part of it. And I think that when I was growing up playing these different genres of music, each genre, whether it was rock and roll, blues, jazz, hip hop, folk music, every genre tapped into different subcultures across Wisconsin. So that's really what exposed me to a lot of different types of people. And that's what made me, I think, a, a curious person. It also taught me a thing or two about listening because in any genre of music, if you're playing in a band, you're not going to play very well if you're not a good listener. And I believe that's the most important skill in any kind of elected official, too. And uh, so music is a fundamental uh, part of my background. And uh, for your listeners who are music fans, we launched a bar band tour across Wisconsin where I play with local bands. The most recent one was up in Stevens Point, where I performed with a band called Nemesis, which is exactly what it sounds like. We played with, uh, let's see, some Black Sabbath covers. Wow. Uh, we had all, all kinds of, I'm trying to think, we played Nirvana, 
um, yeah, we, we had some good, good hits there. And, um, and so, yeah, that's been a lot of fun is playing this bar uh, band. So tour. I've not, uh, I've, I've, I don't have any musical talent. Someone argue, I don't have any talent in anything and they wouldn't be necessarily <laughs> far off, but real quick, what do you mean you have to be a good listener when you're in a band? So for people who aren't in one or yes. have ever played really music, I mean, I played the trombone when I was in high school, but that, I don't think that really counts. Uh, well, why is that important? And what do you mean listening? Listening to what? Yes, listening to your fellow musicians and also in a live performance, listening to your audience. In a lot of styles of music, I would say jazz is the most like this, but even in rock and roll, if you got a guy ripping out a guitar solo, you know, anytime you're improvising, anytime you're playing music and creating okay. in in the moment, you have to truly be listening to everyone else. Even if it's not truly an improvised song, you got to be really hearing and feeling the other musicians if it's going to be a good uh, performance. And I think the best bands that you hear perform live, they are truly live. And you really do that through yeah. listening. Uh, I'm also a former radio DJ as well. Uh, so I'm a big fan of this kind of platform uh, in Milwaukee uh, at uh, WMSE 91.7, where I played everything from rock and roll, blues, uh, jazz, and, and everything in between. So I share this music the musical anecdotes because that is really the best way to get to know me is through music. And that is what informs uh, my politics. Uh, because when I saw the worsening divides and polarization of our uh, politics, I, and Wisconsin becoming like ground zero for a trench war for politics, I wanted to be a part of the solution. Really the spirit I saw in my musical groups, I wanted to bring to politics. And that's what led to founding the millennial action project, which is my main experience that I'm, I'm essentially running on in this race. And the Millennial Action Project is an organization of 2000 young elected leaders in Congress and state legislatures, Democrats, Republicans and independents. And we brought people together to pass legislation. And in the political system we live in, you have to work together with people who are different than you if you're going to pass legislation. And that's what we did. And in Congress specifically, we introduced 200 bipartisan pieces of legislation over 35 of those were signed and passed into law everything from bills to support the veterans community to mental health issues and and many others so i bring to the race the most federal legislative experience while also being an outsider who wants to reform our politics so how did you decide uh to go to run I and mean, be a candidate for u.s senate when when did this all come to be yeah, it came to be, I mean, I first started thinking about it a couple of years ago. Some of my longtime mentors encouraged me to look at the race. And what I was searching for was how can we make Wisconsin not the symbol of polarization and trench warfare politics, but instead the leader in political bridge building. And I truly believe that's in us, but we need leaders who are willing to surface it. As, as President Lincoln said, we need leaders who summon the better angels yeah. of our nature as opposed to feeding the darkest impulses in human behavior. And so I believe that you know, running statewide, where there's a joke out there that says, Wisconsin is not really a purple state. We're just collections of red and blue that don't talk to each other. So that's why running statewide was really exciting because if there's one contribution I hope to make in politics, it's helping people see their common humanity and uh, the common connections across uh, our lines of difference. and. The Senate seat is a great platform to do that. And the second thing is I want to fix the legislative process. Our politics and the system is broken. And I'm running on a platform to reform those politics because think of any issue you care about, whether it's uh, the fact that we just saw a mass shooting uh, in Texas this week, whether it is uh, the, the question of economic opportunity and the ability for people to start businesses, uh, whether it is... Um, uh, the, the farm bankruptcies that we're seeing right now across rural Wisconsin, the substance abuse problems that we're seeing. The one underlying issue is that Congress is not on our side. They're on the side of the big money special interests. And I'm trying to change that system. Mm. And that's the fundamental mm. issue, I think, in this race. Well, so you're, you're basically talking about, you know, logical, rational, reasonable thinking, which yeah. seems <laughs> to contradict poli politics. That's so right. I love what you're saying. 
And, and I think anyone that's listening would say, yeah, that would be great. You know, if we can all yeah. just work together and just get along and, 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 and come to agreements and you may not like everything and you may not like everything, but we'll all get something and it's for the betterment. Yeah, that sounds great. But typically those people don't get elected. So how yeah, do you get right. that? How do you, it may resonate with some, but for some reason, it, even if it resonates with the individual or individuals, it doesn't lead to votes. So how do you yeah. bridge that gap? So I believe the key is activating what I call the exhausted majority. Maybe a lot of your viewers and perhaps you yourself feel like you're part of the exhausted majority. People who feel fed up, pissed off, disillusioned by status quo politics and establishment politics and are looking for something different, something that actually responds to the problems in our lives. And so the key then is getting that message out to enough people. We always felt like if we can get enough people, to, if, if we got a big enough platform and a big enough microphone to get our message out, the more support we would get because this is what people are looking for in Wisconsin, but the establishment media often doesn't like to cover it. So I really think the solution is coming on Dryden Wire and coming on uh, similar platforms that allow us to reach a new kind of audience mm. uh, because we sure as hell know uh, these uh, legacy media outlets are going to be the last to know uh, that a movement is taking over <laughs> our politics here in Wisconsin. You know, and that's, it sounds pretentious and I don't mean it to be, but I've heard that a lot of mm -hmm. people saying, thank you for just coming, uh, having me on the show because uh, uh, nobody else will. And I mm -hmm. honestly didn't really understand that until this election cycle and each election cycle, of course, we have, you know, candidates coming on local and statewide, but we're doing a lot more this election cycle and a lot more in the state level. And we, I kind of get that a lot uh, from people saying that, you know, yeah. they, they, this place or this place, and I don't, I don't listen to talk show, uh, polit uh, political talk show stuff like in Milwaukee or Madison. And obviously we're in Northwest Wisconsin. What do I care? They're talking about things in Milwaukee, and Madison, and that's, that's like forever away. Might as well be in another state for us. So right. I don't know, but I've heard of some of those names and they won't have them on. Or we send an email and they say, yes, we'll schedule it. And then they never hear back. So yeah. I didn't, I hear that echoed from a lot of people. But honestly, I hear that mostly from Republicans, to be honest. Yeah. But you as a Democrat, there is that same thing for Democrats where I, I'm assuming there's like Democrat talk show or left-leaning talk shows, right? Or, 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 or legacy media that's the same experience that you have. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's just because there's a certain mold of a political candidate. And so ever, you know, the legacy media tries to fit you into that mold. And if they can't do that, then they just throw up their hands and say, well, we're not going to cover you. Now yes. we've gotten some coverage around our agenda that we released our agenda to make government work for Wisconsin's exhausted majority, which speaks to the reform issues we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But uh, out, uh, you know, outside of that, we are lighting it up at the grassroots level. That's the other key to uh, winning. And I'll tell you, the legacy media has not come to any multi-candidate events yet on the campaign trail. So they have no idea who's connecting and who's not. And so it's on us to use the tools that we have available to us, digital media, alternative media platforms, to get that message out. Yeah. And here's the, here's the key. And this is the tipping point in this race. I believe the people who are looking for a different kind of politics um, are also uh, the ones who are not following politics day to day. And so when we can get this different message out to the exhausted majority, that is the tipping point. It's going to take, it's going to catch on like wildfire. And it's going to be a movement like I think Wisconsin hasn't seen in a long time. And as you can tell, I'm a very different kind of Democrat. <laughs> yeah, so on the, actually, so I wrote on a couple of things. One, you had brought up that situation in Texas. So I'd be remiss not to bring up gun control and your views on that. But I also wrote down, I want to get to that. Actually, I want to hit, let's do this one first. So you're a different kind of candidate. There are how many people right now, how many Democrats running for U.S. Senate as of today? It's like, Maybe something like 10. I thought it was like nine last I checked, nine or 10. Sure. Yeah. So when you're running for this, is your opponent Ron Johnson or is your opponent the Democrat field? Because there's a primary. So how, how do you kind of broach that? Like, well, OK, well, we kind of need to go after uh, the Republican in this case. But also mm -hmm. I got to 
you know, set myself aside or, or make sure that I can set myself apart from my opponents. So how does yeah. that work? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I first of all, my style of politics is I'm going to work with anyone and work against anyone uh, to pass uh, our agenda. And I don't care which political party uh, you're coming from or which uh, God you worship or, you know, any of those things. I'm going to work with or against anyone uh, to get this done. And so first we got to win the primary and we're running with an unconventional strategy. Uh, we believe that we can get Democrats who want sanity, independents who feel politically homeless and disaffected Republicans to come together and support our campaign in the primary. Mm. And then on top of that, I think that's the strategy to win uh, in November. And I, the second part of that is we're showing up everywhere. I'm traveling to all 72 counties across Wisconsin, including to many counties in northwestern Wisconsin. In fact, when I was talking about playing Tom Petty songs, mm -hmm. in my mind, I was thinking about uh, an event we did in Dunn County with a band called The Cutaways uh, in town. So we're showing up where Democrats don't traditionally show up, and we're showing up where Republicans wouldn't usually show up because the job is being a U.S. senator, which is a statewide office. I think people sometimes forget that. My goal and my job is to represent all of Wisconsinites yeah. and Frankly, we don't see that from too many politicians. Oh, sure. So uh, then circling back to that topic of the situation in Texas, another horrible situation. I talked with a sheriff in our uh, region yesterday, uh, probably echoing the same thing that most people are saying, ugh, this is enough, and why can't we stop this, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And it's easy to kind of complain about it, but we need something done. Is it gun control? I mean, it, getting rid of guns is that it or more restrictions on that is it arming teachers which i don't feel like that's really the direction we want to go but so what is the answer if you were a senator right now what would you be advocating for yeah well i'll start with why our proposal will sound different and is different because i've actually done the work of listening to wisconsinites before i even launched our campaign we did a an event a listening event series across Wisconsin, all different regions, and spoke with a lot of gun owners, mm -hmm. people who use guns for recreational purposes, for hunting, et cetera, spoke with people who are gun control advocates and everyone in between. And so then when I talk about this issue, people say, wow, you sound really different. Well, that's because I just listen to people and I'm conveying what I've heard on the ground. I believe our solution is a post-partisan solution. And it really starts with the metaphor of driving a car. You know, if you drive a car, if you're not trained to do it, if you don't know how to do it, if you don't have a driver's license, you're doing something that's extremely dangerous. You can kill a lot of people driving a car uh, unsafely and if you're not prepared to do that. So as a result, you go to, through driver's ed, uh, you get a driver's license and you have to renew your license. You have to demonstrate you can keep driving a car. I think the same thing applies to owning uh, a firearm and using a gun. Uh, so what I would support is across the board uh, gun licensing uh, so that people in our state, when we have a strong gun culture in our state, mm -hmm. um, you just have to demonstrate that you can use a gun safely. You have to pass, you know, mental health checks and background checks and those sorts of things, you know, to demonstrate that uh, you've gone through some kind of training um, and then you can use uh, use your firearm. And speaking with gun owners across the state, um, this is something they've said they would feel very comfortable and actually would want to do. Um, just to show that, you know, we can have guns, but use them uh, safely in our state. So that is really the, the signature proposal sure. I have. So when you obviously because Wisconsin is uh, wildly different in Milwaukee or the southern Wisconsin mm -hmm. than it is to northwest Wisconsin. I That's mean, right. the, the topic of guns is a, a wildly different conversation from urban Milwaukee to Shell Lake, Wisconsin. With 1,200 right. people, it's wildly different. So when you do go around and you talk to these people, and you said you had those listening sessions, what difference, what was the tone, what was the difference in those conversations when that topic of gun came up, when you look at that juxtaposition between Milwaukee and Rhinelander or Milwaukee and Hayward? Yeah, I think one of the biggest differences is when you're in Hayward, for example, I spoke to people who strongly believe that they need a firearm for self-protection and self-defense. And you know what, if you live, you know, say 50 miles from any kind of, you know, real law enforcement, yeah, you might actually want 
uh, some guns, you know, on, on your property. But if you're in a more um, urban environment, you're dealing with, you know, a lot more crime that might be nearby. And you're going to see a lot more people who just say, we want to get guns off the street. Mm. So these are all totally, you know, rational, you know, conversations to have. Mm. And we, we need, you know, gun safety laws that just allow us to prevent these types of mass shootings that work across the geographic and cultural uh, diversity of Wisconsin. What we cannot have people saying is my solution based on where I live and works in my geographic region is what I want to apply to everyone else where that might not make any sense right. at all. And again, this goes back to the listening. If you actually listen to people's real stories, you're going to hear that a more rational conversation is possible, uh, but you have to get beyond a lot of the partisan rhetoric in order to get there. I also might add just on that point that through my organization, Millennial Action Project, we passed a bipartisan bill related to um, uh, gun violence and, and mental health. And specifically, that was lifting the ban on the Centers for Disease Control to study gun violence and understand really what are the linkages between mental health and gun violence and what we can do to prevent these issues. And we only passed that because we got Republicans and Democrats on board with that. And I'm not saying that's a silver bullet. Clearly, we have to do a lot more than that. But my point is, we want a U.S. Senator representing Wisconsin who can have those conversations, who can convene that kind of space and then actually pass legislation that's going to make a real difference. Yeah. On that topic of law enforcement, a couple of years ago, I mean, there's been some a some, uh, couple of or a few uh, bad situations, uh, tragedies, mm -hmm. cops being, you know, they're not all perfect. They've done some dumb things. Obviously, right. that's not universal. I think we can all agree that the overwhelming majority are amazing. But there's right. always some that whatever. And it was kind of an anti-police. That was like the national narrative there for a while. But now it seems like now, just because it's an election cycle, but now all of a sudden it's like, wait, that's right. We like cops again. So right. where is, I know it's such a general question, but where do you stand on uh, law enforcement? Do we, should we be funding, uh, defunding, supporting? Where do you stand on that? We need to be funding and reforming. And my position there, again, comes from listening and talking to a lot of different groups across the spectrum on this issue. Again, the North Star here has to be, how do we prevent crime and how do we have safe cities and, and towns and, mm. and, you know, and municipalities? And um, the, the key here, though, after speaking to a lot of law enforcement is um, we do, first of all, it's an extremely hard profession. Yeah. And you know, you're being uh, thrust into some of the most difficult situations. Um, you're seeing people, you know, in, in, in just in very challenging uh, times. And, and so we're, it, it's hard. And but what we need to do is help, you know, police officers do their job that they're trained to do. And maybe I think there's some reforming to the training system that, that we can do to make sure that cops are truly prepared for some of those situations. Uh, but in a lot of communities right now where crime has become a big issue, they're not talking about defunding the police. They're talking about funding the police. In fact, yeah. I was talking with uh, uh, an African-American police officer the other day who, who that, that was kind of his message. Now, at the same time, we have to recognize that we need to be funding other social services, too, because why would a lot of the problems we, we see on, on streets right now is related to substance abuse and mental health. And so it doesn't make sense to have police officers going in to essentially be social workers. That's not their job. And so I think we also need, you know, social workers who are, who are actively involved to help people who really need that help. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's really my position on this, which again, I think is more of a post-partisan solution mm -hmm. is let's prepare our law enforcement um, and our, our direct service, you know, organizations and, um, and personnel to be able to do their job. And then I'm a big fan of com community policing and just in general, promoting greater relationships and conversations between the communities and their police force. So it's less adversarial and more cooperative. Yeah. Uh, President Biden, I'm not going to ask you what grade you would give him, but how's he doing? <laughs> well, I, I can tell you what Wisconsinites think, which is uh, his approval rating is, is fairly low. But I honestly, I think the record is mixed. I think that you know, Biden, I think his interest in uniting people, which was part of his message mm -hmm. in his campaign and 
He had a great message around empathy. I genuinely believe that was in his heart. But as we've seen with so many politicians, they can't execute on that because one, they don't necessarily build the teams around them who are dedicated to that mission. I mean, here's the thing. If you're talking about bringing people together and then you hire a bunch of political mercenaries and partisan hacks, I mean, you're just not going to, you know, yeah. execute very well. Yeah. And and having built an organization from scratch, I can tell you the number one determinant of success of any organization is building a great team that's bought into the larger mission. Mm. But then the second thing is he went into a fundamentally broken political system. If there's a financial incentive to divide, demonize and dehumanize, most politicians are going to do that. And that's why a lot of legislation just hasn't passed. And and I'll say on top of that. Congress in Washington is completely owned and operated by the big money special interests right now. And Republicans and Democrats agree on that. If you want to get on the financial services committee right now in Congress, for example, and be the chairman, you got to pay over a million dollars to your party committee. And the money for that. Yeah. You got to pay a price to get on the more lucrative committees. And why are those committees more lucrative? Well, because you've got bigger money interests who are being regulated. So for financial services, you're going to raise that money from Wall Street, which is the exact industry that you're regulating. I mean, that makes no sense. And you can't make this up. None of this stuff passes the common sense test for Wisconsinites. And that's why I have a bit of a, I'm an outsider, but who knows what goes on on the inside. And that is why it's so tough for Biden or frankly, any president to move their agenda right now. No, I know you have a, a, kind of a hard cutoff time here in about five or six minutes. So I w- please, is there something that you want to make sure that you talk about that we didn't you really get a chance to talk about? Yeah, I would say it to anyone who's tuning in right now, we're not playing around with this campaign. Uh, this is serious. This is a once in a generation opportunity to fundamentally fix our politics that are, is broken. If you feel like you're disillusioned, if you feel like you're part of that exhausted majority, this campaign is for you. And the way you know that I'm authentic and serious about this is just listen to my answer so far on this interview. I, I don't think you've heard any rehearsed or partisan talking point once on this. You know, I'm speaking from the heart and I'm independent minded. And I believe Wisconsin has a pretty proud history of electing people who are more independent minded uh, to offices. And I think that's one thing that really binds a lot of us together. But on top of that, it's not just being an outsider and independent minded. It's also having the experience to know how to actually push these things forward. And I've, again, more, I've passed more legislation directly than anyone else on the Democratic side or, frankly, probably even on the Republican side. Sure. And so this, that's the difference here. And I frankly also think that we need a new generation of leadership. And that's why I'm calling for term limits on Congress. I'm proud to be the only candidate on either side of the aisle with a term limits proposal as part of my core agenda. And, you know, even if you voted for Ron Johnson previously, I think one thing we can agree on is that he has broken his pledge to only serve two terms. And a lot of members of Congress go to Washington, become intoxicated with that power. They start to think they're the only ones who can do that job. That's why we need term limits. Congress is too calcified. It's stale. It's backwards and broken. And I think term limits, along with getting big money out of politics, is going to help us solve these perverted set of incentives for Congress to be off the job, literally off the job. They don't even do their job. They spend most of their time fundraising and not legislating. And I think we want to elect someone who can actually do the job. And that's what I'm running to do. So again, we're not messing around here. StephenOlicara.com slash revolution. Uh, out of curiosity, what would the term limit be? Yeah, so I think um, in the Senate, ideally, uh, two terms should be the max. I'd be willing to go negotiate sure. up to three terms at the most uh, in the Senate. And then I think on the House side, similarly, uh, about six terms, I think, really is the ideal. Um, we, I mean, again, if you haven't made a difference in whether it's 12 years or 18 years, I really think it's time to step aside and allow <laughs> right. some new people to, sure. to step in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and here's the thing. Let me just say one more quick thing. Sure, here. sure. The goal in politics 
should not be self-preservation. The goal should be making an impact. And the fact is when most people go to Washington, and I saw this firsthand, most of them think, how can I just keep getting reelected and stay here? And when you don't have term limits, that can go on for a long time because that just means towing the party line, not accomplishing anything and keeping it, playing it safe. Hmm. If you have term limits, that means you have a limited window of time to make a difference. So we want to change that calculus. Again, I'm the only candidate on either side of the aisle calling for term limits. Well, I've heard that before real, uh, realtors and real estate, it's location, 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 right? Those are the yeah. three most important things. And I've heard that about politicians. Get reelected, get reelected, get reelected. Now, it was said, said more like in jest, uh, but there is, I think, a little bit of truth to that. Uh, I guess it kind of depends on the individual. I think there are some bad actors out there and some that, let's face it, are doing a really good job yeah. and they have been in there for quite a while. But yeah, term limits, I think, is, I think that kind of pulls well, doesn't it? I think most people are, yeah. are actually are in support of that. Yep. Over 75% of Americans believe yeah. we need term limits. Yeah. Uh, one more thing. You have a, Demo uh, a Democrat convention coming up, right? No? Yes. In June? Yeah. No. Yes. So the Republican convention was just this last weekend, mm -hmm. and they had this new uh, ability to be able to vote like for nobody. Like I, I can't remember what it was called, but you know I, I'm choosing to not vote for anyone. And you could vote that way. Right. And that was the first time I've seen that. Maybe it's happened before. It's just the first time since I've been kind of paying attention to this stuff. I saw that. How does it work for the for Democrats? Is there a you get vote, and then if you get, I think it's like sixty percent or a certain percentage, then that kind of helps a little bit. You get extra funding, maybe some more access to volunteers. How does it work for you guys? I think on the Democratic side at the convention, if you're a dues-paying member, you can vote in their straw poll. So the party wouldn't make an endorsement, but oh, sure. it would be probably a brief media cycle that just shows the dues paying delegates at the convention said they like X candidate the most and they'll probably rank the candidates from there. Okay. So, All right. Uh, what do you have coming up this uh, weekend? Uh, next week, big stuff happening. Where are you going to be? Yes, yes. Uh, this weekend, we're gathering signatures across the states. Uh, between us and all of your viewers, we've actually already crossed the threshold a boy. Uh, to have enough uh, signatures, nice. but we are continuing to get more just so we have enough of a cushion and frankly, just to show this legacy media that we mean business here. and We have the biggest grassroots operation across the state. So we're going to be out there. If you want to get in touch with us and be part of this movement at Stephen Olicara is on, so is the social media handle on Twitter and Instagram and all the other platforms. Find me on Facebook. I will directly respond to any questions, ideas that you have. Um, and then definitely find us online at stephenolicara.com. If you're Democrat, Republican, Independent, this movement is for you. I know this sounds different, but I believe this is a movement whose time has come. If you're pissed off, this you got to get involved with this campaign. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> Stephen, it was a pleasure. Thank you so hey, very likewise. much. Thank you, Ben. Really yeah. appreciate what you're yeah, doing. You're welcome thank on you. anytime. Special thank you to our guest today, Democrat candidate for U.S. Senate, Stephen Olicar. For Dryden.com, I'm Ben Dryden. I'll see you right back here tomorrow morning when I'll be chatting with Sawyer County Judge, the Honorable John Yackel. So until then, thanks for watching and have a blessed day.